Coding with AI is a brand new paradigm, so it's very natural that when you're getting started with it, you might make some common mistakes. And I've been coding with AI for over a year now, so I've run into these issues myself and figured out the best way around them. So I'd like to share that with you today. And the first thing that I see people do is expect too much or ask too much from the AI. You'll see people make games like Pong or Flappy Bird with just one prompt, and people expect that this means the AI can just handle big operations like that. The reality is more nuanced. The reason that the AI can create games like that and build custom applications in one go is because it's already been trained on the code for those sorts of games. So when you type in Pong, it's essentially pulling that out of its training data and just replicating the game. And oftentimes the games aren't that complicated. They, they're not as complicated as a full stack enterprise piece of software. So when you're starting to code with AI, you might have unrealistic expectations in terms of what it's really capable of when it comes to implementing your own ideas instead of something that's just copy pasteable off the internet. The analogy I like to make is you can ask Chad GPT to write the Declaration of Independence and it will write it and it's an impressive document, but it didn't really require a lot of work to actually do that. It's essentially just copy pasting it from its training data. So think of code in the same way. The AI models are going to have a much easier time writing code that's already been discussed and has a lot of examples online, but it'll have a harder time when it's dealing with kind of new and specialized cases that you might be exploring. Now, of course, it is capable of generating new code and adapting to the kind of variables that you have and the circumstances that you give it, but just keep in mind, it's not gonna be able to write a whole application in one go, so don't expect it to do that. Models are continuously improving, and I'm sure we'll see more and more capabilities, but you gotta hone in on what the model is capable of and ask it for just the right amount of work. Which brings me to the next mistake that people make, which is actually expecting too little or asking for too little. So you'll see people kind of wanna you know, have full control of their code, and that's understandable. That's how we've been developing for many years. But they'll go in and they'll ask it for just one little change. You know, they'll ask it to write one little function, and that's okay. You can you, you can still speed yourself up by doing that sort of thing. But if you're doing that, I don't think you're taking advantage of the models as much as you could be. So there's really a balance that you got to strike in understanding what the models are capable of, and then you want to use it in a way where it's making a lot of progress progress and you want to be just on the edge of what the model is capable of. And recently with Sonnet 3.5, the model is capable of doing a lot. So the way I like to use it, you'll see in some of my other videos, is I'll think of one feature that's kind of a small to medium sized feature and I'll kind of tag the relevant files and I'll have it implement things that are, you know, working in the UI the API layer, interacting with the database. I'll have it implement that full stack feature, but I'll keep it to you know just that feature. And if I have some specializations and customizations I wanna make, then I'll have that in the follow-up prompts, or I'll just start a new chat and implement that separately. So if you're asking it to just implement a particular function and then you're switching to another file, it's just gonna take you a lot longer to implement features and build product than it needs to. So really try to understand what the model is capable of and ride it just at the edge of its capabilities. And if it makes mistakes, Sometimes it just makes more sense to roll forward and have it edit its code to get it back to a working state than to go all the way back and try to do it in these tiny little pieces. Now, since we're talking about balancing too much and too little, there's another area where that applies, which is the amount of context that you give the model. If you give it too much context, it's actually gonna just get confused. Like if every time you ask it to make some code changes, you give it your entire code base, there's a good chance that models will just get confused and give you some kind of random junk and that might just discourage you from using them, but it's just because the meaning of what you want gets diluted if you give it a lot of context. And you'll see this across the board with LLMs. The more context you give them, the more diluted it makes everything. On the flip side, you do wanna give it enough so that it actually knows how to implement the things that you want to build. 
if you don't tell it what the API looks like or how your database is structured, it's gonna make assumptions and that can lead to mistakes. So make sure to tag the relevant files if you're working in an IDE like Cursor so that you can get the right code generated on the first go. That's gonna account for all of those different aspects and the way that the functions interact with each other. Generally speaking, when I'm working with Cursor and Sonnet 3.5, this means maybe tagging three or four different files that are you know, 100 lines or so long. That seems to be the sweet spot where it's enough context, but not too much. And speaking of file sizes, one mistake that's really easy to make working with AI is to end up in a situation where you have really poorly organized code. You have to be really proactive in organizing your code and refactoring it so that you can have reusable pieces and so that you don't have a bunch of duplicated code or just things that you're not using anymore that are laying around because the pace of coding is just a lot faster now. So it's easier to end up with those artifacts and things that are no longer relevant um, or to end up with really long files that are too difficult to process when you're asking for new features. So what I like to do is when files get to be, you know, over 100 lines, if they get to be like 200 lines long, I'll just try to figure out a way to refactor or, you know, regroup the functions or the functionality of those files and create new files so that I can then reuse those functions in a new context or I can just tag the relevant files for creating new features. This also really applies to styling and using components because by default, the models will just write code from scratch and you can easily end up with inconsistencies like buttons of different color or maybe when you hover over them, they are handled a different way, you know, different sizing and padding and margins, all of this kind of stuff. You really want to use something like a design system like Material UI or Shad CN or at a minimum use Tailwind and really configure the properties so that you just get a consistent look and feel across your application. And this is something that the AI isn't really going to do by default. So you got to make sure that you instruct it to do that. And again, just continuously refactor your code, make sure it's organized, and that's going to make it easier for you to add new features. And for somebody new, if they ever have to look at your code, including your future self, it's gonna make it easier for you to navigate and figure out how things work. Which brings me to the next mistake, which is not understanding your own code. I think AI really enables a lot of new people to code and enables people to code much faster than they would otherwise, which gives way to situations where you might just accept all the code that it generates and then just assume that it's good and just move on, build more features. But you really want to understand what it's doing because you might end up in a situation where there's a security hole or the application could start behaving in a way that you didn't expect. And this is just because you didn't review the code and you didn't take the time to understand what it's doing. So it's really easy to fall into that trap of just assuming that the code that is generated by AI is all good to go. Uh, but I highly recommend you really try to understand what it implemented, even if it's a really quick glance. Imagine you're like reviewing a pull request from a junior engineer. That's, that's the best sort of attitude to have towards working with AI, in my opinion. And if you're absolutely new to this stuff, you really want to use this opportunity to learn how to code and what the code is actually doing, because it's not just there for us to easily communicate with computers. It's there to structure our thoughts and to put our ideas into something that is logically coherent. In other words, the code that we write isn't up for interpretation. It is doing a certain set of instructions that's going to be consistent every time it executes. And this is a big difference between natural language and structured code, which is why I don't think in the big picture AI is going to completely replace code because we still need a structured way to communicate these ideas and describe how these programs function so that we have a reliable, repeatable way for our applications to work. So the last mistake that I see people make is accidentally and unintentionally sharing sensitive information like API keys with these AI vendors. Oftentimes you'll keep sensitive data stored in something like a .env environmental variable file. And by default, that's still gonna get uploaded to Cursor when they index your project. 
However, you can update your git ignore or cursor ignore files to prevent those files from going to cursor. So I highly recommend that you do that. And the cool thing is they do respect the git ignore file. So that's probably the easiest place to do it so that you're not committing it into git and you're also not sharing those sensitive API keys and whatever other variables with cursor. Avoiding these mistakes is gonna save you a ton of time when you're working with AI. And if you wanna know more about coding with AI, take a look at this video, which is gonna walk you through cursor, which I believe is the best AI coding tool around right now. Or if you wanna see it really in action, take a look at this video, which will show me building an application from scratch for multiple hours. So you'll get to see all of this hands-on. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching, take care.